I'm very happy to introduce uh, Chris Skinner uh, from right here in Princeton, who's going to give a talk on an order system for the symmetric square of a modular. Thanks. Um, yes. So the, the title of this talk is the Euler system. Um, with a symmetric square of a modular form. Explain all of these words as we go along. Uh, well, more or less. Questions. Modular form. And it's actually sort of a, a real pleasure to talk about this here in this room, at these boards, because it was in lectures here where I first learned about Euler systems from, from Carl Rubin when he was giving his Hermann Weil lecture, which then became that uh, Princeton Press book on, on, on Euler systems. Um, so I'm going to report today on some work on an Euler system for the symmetric square of a modular form. And I want to say that this is a joint work. With, um, with Marco, San Giovanni, He's a graduate student here at Princeton. So I'm going to I'm going to begin by recalling some some bits about Euler systems, and then I'm going to describe sort of exactly the Euler system for most. Which is that for the symmetric square of a modular form. And then I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the construction of that Euler system. Where it comes from. All right, so that's in the dark. So, section one Euler systems. So usually, we start off maybe, I'm going to give myself some scalars, which is going to be some finite extension of QP. And um, it's going to have a ring of integers. Oh, well. Integers. And we're going to have some finite dimensional L space with a continuous action. And I'm only going to consider things you know, over Q, some matters. Um, this should be unramified. Outside uh, some finite set of primes, S, finite set of primes, and um, almost always this this should be um, sort of geometric, which I mean potentially semi-stable or drum at, at the prime p. That's going to be a nice nice kind of. Um, Chaotic representations and maybe um, T inside V is going to be some GQ stable overall lies. Then an Euler system for T is a nice collection of Gawa cohomology classes. So it's a collection of cohomology classes. See them in the Galois cohomology of T, ideally, um, and, and indexed over over cyclotomic extensions. And okay, well, it's not just any collection. I need to satisfy certain compatibilities. And there's some room in, in how you want to, to index these M's. Here, I'm, I'm probably going to take um, M is to, to probably, I'm going to restrict myself to sort of powers of P times a, a product of, of primes L not in, not in the set S. I can, I can enlarge this. The set as big as I want, and I can. There's a lot of room to sort of restrict to the primes that you're interested in here. So something like this, and then you can satisfy some compatibilities. So 
properties, and that's this the so-called norm relations. That if we look at the class C of m times L for one of m times L is also supposed to be one of class in this kind of condition, then I can look at the co-restriction of this class from Q to N. And now I'm going to write, I'm going to shorthand this as just Q, Q brackets. So maybe M L down to Q to Q. Um, and we want to know how this class, this co-restriction compares to the class at level M. And this is then given to, this is C of M. Say if M divide, if L divides M to begin with. And otherwise, there's some polynomial P of L since that when we evaluate it on an arithmetic for Banius, the inverse of an arithmetic for Banius, and then act on, on C of L. That's the co restriction class. So L not dividing M. So what is P of L? P of L of X is the characteristic polynomial. Oh, it's the determinant of one minus x, but the action of the inverse again of the arithmetic banius on not quite on v, but on the arithmetic dual. So the dual, and then with one, one the twist. And so, as my as I understand it, this is the origin of Euler system, the term Euler in the Euler system, because these look like Euler factors of, of an L function. Attached to the gallery representation. So, so you also plug in this the, the same like draw of the inverse x. Um yes, so it's the prop in, in here, but it's acting on this class, which is in the cohomology with V. So it's not zero. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean like. You PL X is that thing then then PL Robinius L inverse to be like we replace X. Oh yeah, yeah. We could replace yes, you can rewrite this with, with, with some Frobenius and maybe have L to the inverse and various things to it. Yeah. There, there are lots of ways to write it. This turns out to be a convenient one. Yes. And in fact. Um, it's not so essential that you work with this polynomial. You can work with polynomials that are sufficiently congruent to it. And many things. There's a lot of flexibility within the, the, the framework for Euler systems. So this is just a, a nice axiomatic treatment. Um, so the utility of, of Euler systems arises from From their applications to, to controlling sizes of Selmer groups. So generally, if for example, um, if the bottom class C1 is, is not zero, then then one gets out of the what I would call the other system machine um, bounds on certain Selmer groups and bounds on the sizes or the orders on Selmer groups. So Galois cohomology groups for the dual module. So this would be Baham. Uh, I'm sure it's the ZP Hans for from T into this. So these might this might be something like the summer group of an elliptic curve or a related things. Um, and so that's one of the reasons when it looks for Euler systems, they allow you to, to, to sort of prove finiteness and maybe some kind of sharp finiteness results on the sizes of the Selmer groups. Um, the, the kind of compatibility where we're allowing powers of P, um, you, can, you can often you can look at, um, I'll call it C underline infinity to be the inverse limit. Over, over the powers of P at CPM, this, this kind of compatibility, this gives me a class and with the Iwasawa cohomology. And um, 
this leads then so if if this is not zero this leads to sort of results in the Iwasawa theory that are analogous to these kinds of balance in summer groups. You get balance on characteristic ideals of, of summer groups. And um, maybe one other point is that once you have Euler systems, particularly we all have the, this variation in, in the prime powers of the prime key, then we can um, we can get other Euler systems from the from a process that's sometimes called um, the Soule twisting. So then we can get an Euler system basically by by passing over to. Uh, over, over these cyclotomic extensions and then specializing under powers of, of the Galois group, the characters of the Galois group. This, I can get, well, can get other systems for, for not just for V or T, let's say for T, and then we can twist by, well, we'd like to get twists by every power of the, the cyclotomic line, but in, in practice, I mean, which are really a good power. Is, is things that are congruent to one modular powers of P. Um, at least that's all I'm going to work on. So here, here epsilon is, is just a cyclotomic character. So it gives the action on P power groups of unity. Um, so omega is just the mod P version of that. So taking values in the P minus one groups of unity, but we stick those back into ZP cross by the type of the So these, these are congruent to each other mod P, and so this is congruent to one mod, mod P. And that's because really other systems, to do other systems, all you really need um, and often is to go up, not just these full extensions, but in, uh, only the, the, the P part of these extensions. It really matters. All right, so finally, um, so this is going to be, this is going to be important. And um, this is obvious, these two points are obviously important for any kinds of applications to, to anything. Uh, we need to know, we produce something that's not zero. So the first two points, Here, these are sort of which is C1 being not zero or, or this C infinity not vanishing. These are usually established in each situation with um, something that now is often called ex an explicit reciprocity laws. Um, which does have some relation to reciprocity laws in, in class field theory, local class field theory, but um, just the origin of the name. But what really happens is that one looks at the, the localization at P, so of, of the class. This is in and actually, um, Piatic Hodge theory allows us to say, describe this for these kind of the geometric representations um, in terms of other, other data. And um, so what ends up happening is that one ends up describing this in, in often in, in geometric terms. So if this Galois representation V arose from say the cohomology of some variety, then one might be able to describe this local cohomology in terms of, of 
say things like the um, the B Duram of this or the D Duram, the Duram name module of this this representation, and that's related to the Duram cohomology of the, the, the variety where this D came from, and so one might be able to describe. I mean, it depends on how you've constructed the class, this class in terms of the, the Duram cohomology of the variety. And then there's ways of, of sort of identifying this. Hopefully in terms of formulas that involve sort of the Duram cohomology, which you can then try to, to compare with formulas that you compute with. And that's the explicit part. And, and ultimately this, this um, you, you compare, Ideally, with formulas for values of L functions related to the L representation. So this whole picture, then, um, the idea is you're going to construct these classes, those collection of classes that have these nice relations. Um, the sort of Galois cohomology arguments say then that we can control sizes of, of inter arithmetically interesting Selmer groups in terms of these classes. Explicit reciprocity law ideally relates something about those classes to L values. And then you, and the ultimate um, relations I'm looking for is that whatever bound that you got on these Selmer groups is related to that expression for these, these local factors in terms of these L values. And you get something like an L value is equal to the order of a Selmer group, which is the kind of, um, special value formula that we look for in things like the Blockado conjectures or the, you know, the, the Bruce Winner and Tiger conjecture. All right, so, so what I want to do is now describe all of these, all of these aspects for a particular Galois representation. So now we might let, let F be, um, a new form at some level n and weight two. And for simplicity today, I'm even going to say trivial character. This is this is not necessary, but we do focus just on weight two so far in our work, just not to, to unduly complicate the, the situation. So then associated to F, there's a there's a the usual Galois representation. And what am I meaning by the usual Galois representation? So if I look at, maybe I'll just do X1 of them. Um, with some sufficiently large uh, field coefficients. A top homology, this is over, over two bar. I want, there's gonna be some Some quotient of this, and um, and I'm picking the quotient. So it's a quotient associated with this. So the L function of this Galois representation geometrically defined. So defined using the geometric Frobenius and the Euler factors gives you the the usual L function of F. So that's what this quotient is. Um, so the L function. And then that's not quite the V that we're interested in though. So the V I'm, I'm going to be looking at is, first I'm gonna take V um, to be the add zero of this representation. So zero, we can just think of this also as a representation that's taking the Homs from V to itself. That's a Galois representation. And then we're taking the trace zero elements inside it. Um, and, and then, I'm also going to end up having to twist by a character where chi is going to be an odd character to start with. I'm interested in this actually for, for reasons. I'm going to twist by an odd character and I'm going to take power of the cyclotomic character. It's going to be my initial representation. Yeah. But if I can construct my Galois representation, or my, not the Galois, if I construct the, the Euler system for this Galois representation, then the Soule twisting is gonna let me, let me get rid of things like 
Michael's power of the psychotomic character at the expense of having some critics in twists in there. So this is this is going to be the, the V of interest. And um, maybe I should say that if I had put OL here, and I look at the image of the integral cohomology in here, that, that would be the lattice T of F. And then the corresponding lattice T is going to be you replace V of F. So the theorem, what, what we do So we construct um, classes as desired in the input of V for this V being the add zero of the twist of the add zero. And probably, uh, the way I'm going to use chi, I better put a chi inverse there. Um, go, if, if anyone saw any of my talks earlier at Berkeley, you know, I, I cannot get chi and chi inverse straight. So, um, right, so, so we'll, yeah, we'll form, construct these classes um, such that. The C of them are, in fact, an Euler system. And um, if we look at this this C infinity underline, so we look at this this limit with respect to the co-restriction of the powers of P. This class, we can look at this class. And um, we can evaluate it under a map for V, which I'm going to call script L of V of PR. This is the Panru's big logarithm. And so it, what it describes or it patches together is the is all of these connections and are all of these explicit reciprocity laws for, for these various classes, which are given in terms of the block Cotter logarithm, or, um, in this case. Um, and that this, in this situation, um, class, but there's also, yeah, it's up to some, some constant, Possible, but we have the non zero constant that we're working out is the, the piatic L function for the, this, um, the adjoint twisted by chi, which is an element of an, of an Iwasawa algebra. And this is the piatic L function. It was constructed, well, it's been constructed by a number of people, um, most notable, most completely by, by Bokor and Schmidt and by, by Zhang Lu. And it's Zhang Lu's construction of this, not just the existence of the L function, but how the L function arises. That's, a, that's of most particular importance to us. So this, I need to say a few things. Um, this. Qualify that. So, for the symmetric square in the title, is that because at zero is the same as symmetric square? Um, let me let me comment on this. Oh, on the symmetric square. Yeah. So there's a number of comments. So first of all, this. Yes, that's an excellent question. Why, why I'm talking about at zero? What happened to the symmetric square? Uh, 
star means this is for, for f, um, we assume to be p ordinary. Um, and I think to get, there's an issue in the literature, most often these, these p-adic L functions are incomplete. They're missing Euler factors at the primes that divide. And um, that's perfectly fine for upper bounds, but if you want um, sort of a, a exact bounds for things, then you want to have all the Euler factors. Um, F, F is ordinary, and, and I want to say that um, all Euler factors if at least if n is, is, is square three. So I think we can handle this. Uh, and maybe the star also means we're checking the details on this part. This part is perfectly fine. We're still like we would like this, this constant to actually be a piatic unit. And we that's, need to be a little bit careful about that. And and at least, and then also then we have to. I haven't told you anything about the periods I'm using to normalize this piatic L function. So there's this bit. You want it to be a piatic unit to get better bounds, or mm -hmm. okay. yeah, um, yeah. So so also there was the question: What happened to the symmetric square? So it, um, so the symmetric square would be. I mean, so the the adroit is sitting inside uh, the v of f tends to v of f dual. So well, that is the adjoint, and then that gives us the ad zero of f plus the trivial representation plus a line. If I had done, of course, via tensor vf, that would be the symmetric square of vf, and then plus the determinant. And since I'm assuming it's trivial, Mevin type is um, the determinant of Gallo representation. In this case, well, is, is epsilon minus one geometrically. Um, but I can I can get this this one comes from this by by twisting at, at the character by epsilon minus one and we can do the Sule twisting to to get to it. So, um, so I, why did I put symmetric square in the title because that's what people like to talk about but it's really the x zero yeah uh -huh. so this is just twisting by. by And actually, I'm probably most interested in the symmetric square of this dual here, and then we would twist it the other direction. So I should also say I stated it this way because there are other results about um, other systems for the symmetric square. This work of, of Leffler and Zerbus, where they, they take their work on the rankin selberg Euler systems and, and specialize them to the situation of, with the two forms of the same. And there's also um, some work of Eric Urban, where he uses congruences between Euler's uh, Eisenstein series and, and Kusper and other modular forms on um, symplectic groups. To, to construct a Euler system. Um, this is a different construction and, and maybe uh, avoids some of the, the difficulties that arise in, in the other two constructions. Um, and it's a construction that doesn't rely, it, it's sort of geometric, but it doesn't rely on motivic origins for the classes. And it seems to have some flexibility, meaning there are a number of other situations where, where the same ideas can, can provide a yield for the system. So this is kind of, really this is a sort of a, a test case for these ideas. So we get a new Euler system by these ideas and hopefully it equals a bunch of, bunch of other ones. So we're working out to see what kinds of complications arise. In this part B, this periodic function, this is depolating I suppose you have only one critical point, so you're working with a two modular form. That's right. Well, um, there's the, yeah, so it's like sim squared. I mean, we're thinking of sim squared, it's like sim squared two twisted by my characters. Um, why should, okay, so mostly now I want to talk about this construction. Why should we even believe for this particular V that another system should exist? 
why should there be these classes exist? So there's a kind of a philosophy um, that, well, and can be made very precise in the block versions of the block product conjectures, that one should have classes, non-zero classes in these homology groups only if corresponding L functions vanish. Um, so, and it turns out that if we look at L, LV, well, it's not really LV, it's going to be LV dual, it's that arithmetic dual I was talking about at the desk. If the, the order of vanishing at S equals zero of this is positive, and in fact, it's um, that's where this chi, chi being odd comes in, it's the exact order one um, for, for odd characters chi. And so we would expect classes to, to exist. And uh, the exact order vanishing one, which holds for not only for chi, but if I twist chi by any even, any even character, sort of suggests that there's some kind of uniqueness. And we can hope that all of these classes align themselves in some nice way, which is the Miller system way. So at least this is consistent. Having another system is consistent with the things that we expect. So that's always a good, good sanity check. Um, So maybe, uh, where do we actually get these classes? Well, so one way to think about classes in, in, in a Kawa cohomology group like this are extension classes, right? So they, these are extensions, or right? classifying extensions like this. Um, and of course, if I twist the whole exact sequence by some character, I can also think of that as being uh, classes in this Kawa cohomology group. So actually, I'm actually going to look at things that are like the add zero of the F, and this one is fine. Well, this should be L, and then L, I, S, and minus three, actually. Well, I'm going to construct some extensions like this or realize them fairly explicitly, and, and they're going to give me classes, classes in here. That's the sort of the idea. So I'm going to go looking for, for these kind of extensions. And my motivation for, for where to look is um, is the doubling integral for, for the L function. And this doubling integral of it's a well known integral that representation in automatic forms. So one starts with. Um, so, so G is going to be the SP4, or maybe GSP4, or maybe SO32, depending on, but connect it maybe with something you've seen. I'm going to, I'm going to take SP4. And we're going to look at um, sort of P to be the Ziegel parabolic. So, this is the, the set of things in the form. I start to ask first. Original two, so it's a nice parabolic, stabilizing an isotropic line. So I have to tell you, for this to be a parabolic, I'm taking um, the, the sort of the usual form, symplectic form that looks like this, to define G. So this parabolic, and then what one looks at um, is, is so the I pi, which is going to be the normalized 
induction from from this. Of um, chi, I mean, I think of it as a, as a character of the levy, the levy here is GL2, by composition with the determinant of A. And, and then there's the modulus character, which is also uh, the determinant. Yes. And then I'm going to raise, I'm going to put down a parameter. So the modulus character would be the determinant, absolute value of the determinant of Q, which I found. I'm having a sort of a variable S here. So this is Mike's S. And um, so then if I take take some some section of this, I can I can form an Eisenstein sentence. This is sum over. On the global points, G, and um, I have to worry about convergence of this. It converges absolutely for the for the real part of this being, in this case, I guess, larger than a half. But we're actually interested, going to be interested in the case where S is one. S is a half, and so we have to use an analytic continuation. I'm not going to worry too much about that. Um, and and the doubling interval is that I, I'm going to look. I'm going to take my Eisenstein series. I'm going to restrict it to to a, to a subgroup. And, and integrate. So what's going to happen is I'm going to have H be SL two cross SL two or really. SP2 cross SP2. And I'm going to, I'm going to, there's going to be a particular embedding inside G as such that the SL2 on the levy gets identified with the diagonal SL2 here. Um, so I have H and, and then I, I integrate this in. And phi is going to be an element of a cusp representation of H, which I could think of as, as sort of. You know, as a representation of SL2 and SL2, so the one associated to my modular form. Yes, and, and this, this kind of the, the doubling formula is that this equals up to some factors the, the adjoint L function of a pi f, which is the standard L function of pi of f SL2. Symplectic thing, um, twisted by chi and evaluated maybe at s plus. Yeah, there's some shift there. With them. And, and usually this is up to um, a number of, of Euler factors. So you get you get the, the right representation for, for some Euler factors. Um, there's also um, some terms sometimes that you need to normalize your Eisenstein state. There's some L, some Dirichlet L factors that appear often in the denominator for these formulas, and then you clear them out by by normalizing the the Eisenstein series or the section, and that turns out to be the right thing for doing any kind of arithmetic anyway. So the important thing is is this, and and so this is where we, uh, some one place where we have to worry about about. Uh, the 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 other factors perhaps a level with for that. Um, but what's going to happen then? So what I'm going? Where, how am I motivated by this doubling method? Well, certainly there's something here that's related to to the, the L function of interest. This is in fact the kind of integral that's used to, by by Zhang Lu and, and Bokor and Schmidt to construct this piadic L function. So you. Kind of can piadically interpolate these these intervals. Um, there's, there's probably we have written this for some some period of the that's that's inside here as well. The inner product of the with itself. 
Um, and that's, 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 but that's all on the analytic side. So what we're looking for is some sort of geometric expression. And so these Eisenstein series are particularly simple um, for good choices of the section F, particularly at infinity, and, uh, this, and, and the right value of S, they give us nice holomorphic modular forms. They're called Ziegel Eisenstein series often because they were actually first, first sort of studied by Ziegel. Um, these students, uh, they were intensely studied by Shimura and his students. We know everything pretty much there is to know about these Eisenstein series. They are the most natural generalization of the Eisenstein series that we're, we're used to for, for in terms of like, you know, modular forms. Um, they have Fourier coefficients um, that, are, that are particularly, that are, that are fairly nice. They're not as nice as divisor sums, but they're still polynomials. Um, sort of universal polynomials with evaluated on, on, on sort of values of the character chi, more or less. And um, so they're, they're very reasonably nice to work with. And so they have obvious sort of arithmetic properties. Um, in particular, being holomorphic differentials or holomorphic module functions, I just said the magic word, they give me a differential, a holomorphic differential on the um, symmetric domain associated to the symplectic group. So the, the single modular variety for, for GS2. And that contributes to cohomology in middle degree. And I can study that, that, that cohomology class. And I, it, because of the explicit nature of these Eisenstein series, one, I can prove a lot about the cohomology class, that, that it's rational when, suitable, when the sections are suitably um, normalized, that the Galois group if we look at the atoll realization, the Galois group is just acting through well, the character chi, and depending on your coefficients, your atoll coefficients, you get this um, epsilon to the minus three as well. So you get an object like this from the cohomological realization of, of these Eisenstein series. So the picture is the following. I'm going to let say X be the Schumer variety for, for G for some, some level. And so this is the single modular variety. And I'm going to have the middle degree, so it's, this is a, a threefold, so the middle degree cohomology is three. I can look at X, it's defined over Q, which we're really work, working with GSD for. Something like that. Um, and I'm going to put, I'm going to write Q chi, well, Q, Q chi. So this is going to be the extension of, of QP that contains the values of chi. And my if I've, if I've made the right choice of, of, of sections, so I've chosen the, the section at infinity to be in the, the holomorphic discrete series for weight three modular forms, and uh, I'm taking the value of s equals a half in this case, then I can get a differential associated to, to my Eisenstein series. And if I've appropriately <coughs> normalized that differential by, by those, those um, there's the L values that I was mentioning, then I can actually see that I have a class that's in, it's in here. How does this work? Well, um, the first thing I can do is I can look at that, I can say that the automorphic representation generated by this Eisenstein series doesn't show up in the interior cohomology of, of this. Um, so it's only seen in the boundary cohomology. And the boundary cohomology has an obvious rational structure. In fact, I can understand everything about this Eisenstein series by restricting to this, the sort of the lowest dimensional section or, or stratum of, of the boundary, the analog of cusps. And, um, and there, the, 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 
the contribution from these classes or the images class and that, and that boundary is really the, just given by the section F that we started with. Maybe times some powers of pi. Um, we're taking residues. Um, but anyway, I'm ignoring that. And, and so we can read off the, the rationality of this class actually from, from just the values of that section. And that section is very explicit, and we can see they're taking algebraic great values. Um, moreover, we, we we know completely how um, the Galois group is is acting on the boundary. Um, for the canonical model for the for the Bailey Borel compactification, and um, and so from that uh, we have a nice description of how. The Galois group is acting on the image of this class in that boundary stratum. And as I said, that it's the image in the boundary stratum completely determines this kind of an Eisenstein series. And so we can read off the Galois action. And, and we get that we get that the Galois group is acting by this. So actually, if I put QP chi here, then this is a Galois representation of QP chi. chi. Um, this is this is exactly analogous to, to the way um, one can study the contribution to the cohomology, the open modular curve, in classical Eisenstein series by, by looking at, at the cusps. Um, so that's one that's one particularly simple aspect of these Eisenstein series. There, there are other Eisenstein series um, on on. Just before that are holomorphic, but are induced from more complicated sections. Um, and, and it's much more complicated to describe their contributions. So, but this is a particularly nice one. All right. So, um, so now where am I going to see kind of this, this sort of restriction with H and, and, and this kind of an extension? So I'm going to look at relative cohomology. So I'm going to have Y to be the Schumer variety of H with some compatible level, level KH. And I'm going to look at the relative etal cohomology. Chi, which has an, a sequence, and then, and then the kernel from this is, is the cohomology of Y. And now I'm going to realize I've made a mistake. It's not the, the add at zero that I'm, I'm seeing here, but in fact, it's see square. And that's why I'm going to get a two over there, not a three. Um, so you can think of this as, what is this? This is going to be essentially the product of two modular curves. Modular form F will show up in cohomology. We'll have here we'll have an H1 of one curve, tensor H1 of the other curve. And so we have um, in fact some square of that quotient here. And so then we can do a sort of push forward, pull back, and we get some, some extension here as a sub quotient of that. And, and that would be the class of our in the, in the Galois cohomology group. So um, now we would then be interested in the non triviality of such classes, among other things. And so the reason I've, I've written it this way is to try to, to also at least convince you that there's some kind of connection with formulas like this. So one you could imagine is that you want to ask whether this, is, this extension is trivial. So instead of working with a top homology, let's try to look at the same extension in Durham homology. And then and ask whether that, that sort of the extent, extension is split in some sort of a hot structure sense. And we would have very explicit classes here. Um, so we have like, this could, in the Durham world, this could also be represented above 
by the class of our, our form in some, some way. And um, then we're asking, for example, if I, if I apply complex conjugation, such like some combination of this and its image under complex conjugation, we can make the class trivial inside here. And we, want to, we would want to know whether it's, it's still it's trivial here or not. Well, since the image is a class that's trivial here, whatever that combination of forms was, it's the it's, it's D of some differential that's contributing to, to the H2 of, well, not necessarily the H2 of X, but when we restrict it to, to Y, it contributes. Um, and we would like to know essentially whether that's non-zero and how do we detect whether something is non-zero and drum monty, we, we integrate against another class. So we would have some primitive of our Eisenstein series or some essentially some and we've cooked up from our Eisenstein series, and we we detect whether it's non-trivial or not by integrating over H with with a differential in H. We take some some pairing, and if that was not zero, then we would, would discover that our extension was non-split. So um, I, I sort of wanted to say things this way so that you believe that formulas like this actually naturally appear in trying to analyze these extensions using um, Durand methods. And so we get, um, when we try to use piadic Durand methods instead of real analytic, then we get expressions that later get reinterpreted as L functions, values of piadic L functions. Um, so, so, now, so now we need to organize these classes into an Euler system and then show that they satisfy the norm relations that we want that these, these, as we vary, vary the classes. The, those, the vertical maps on the extremes, your sim squared VF would be a sub. Yeah, okay. So this one's a sub. This one's a quote quote. Yeah. Oh, I can choose the means, but I can choose the projection. Cospital cohomology from cospital cohomology you can quotient down, but you how would you quotient from H2 to the uh, to say even inner cohomology? What's the most natural way of, of constructing? I don't have to pass the map doesn't have to pass them. Um, I mean, there would be some natural map to inter intercomology, but the heck operators, right? That I can just build, I can I can kill off the boundary. So this is some some you can this is some map modulo, some heck operators which would kill kill the boundary. Um, So, Chris, uh, I have a question. I don't know if you hear me. Yes, very, very clearly. You're, okay. So you didn't have to take the symmetric square. You could have also taken two different modular forms and projected onto uh, VG tensor VH, right? Uh, that's or an excellent question. And the answer is you cannot. So huh. in this situation, if instead I had taken pi one tensor pi two, then, then, then the integral would be zero. If, if pi two is not the... The contradiction <coughs> has to do because you end up with this this period here, which in this case is sort of the interval yes. over, over the diagonal SL two of of, of phi. Mm -hmm. So this this actually only sees the the symmetric. I mean, sort of the situation where you would have the adjoint. So it, and so in particular, yeah, congruence is between f and other f and other forms show up, but they only kind of show up once. That's another simplifying factor in this in this setup. Um, yeah, good question. Yeah, so this is this, but this only applies to the symmetric square. It doesn't tell me anything at all about rank rank itself. Right? Um, I can tell that I'm 
not very practiced in, in giving this talk. Um, so, so where is the Euler system going to come from? We, we need extensions over, over or cohomology classes that are sort of really defined over other fields. And right now I've given you extensions that are of, of GQ. And, and what, what they're going to come from is basically, let's say this, this would go to, to some C chi, which is really, it depended on this, this choice of this, this Eisenstein series. And I, I'm going to look at a sum of such extensions where I'm going to vary then psi over the characters mod m and even characters mod m. And then I'll have one over the order of such signs. And this is going to give me something. So there's no longer some natural Gawa action of a GQ on this, right? It's just. It's just GQ of mu, mu of M um, of, of V. So when you do this, why would, I mean, this seems quite kind of silly. Um, why does it work? Well, it works um, precisely because of what I said about how simple the Fourier coefficients of, of these Eisenstein series are that, um, so let's imagine that to, to get things inside T, we really need these Fourier coefficients to be integral, let's say. That's, that's morally correct. It's not precisely correct when we allow P in the level. Um, let's see what's, but if we have, you know, universal polynomials in the values of chi psi, when, when I sum, sum over, you know, I have something, I have some multiple of, of psi d for some d, and I'm summing over, over, over all the psi's, I'm going to get um, zero, unless d has some particular, particular property. And then in that case, I'm going to get the number of such size. And so then I can divide by the number of such size, and I haven't changed the integrality of the cohomology, of, of the Fourier coefficients. And that can be um, then leveraged into saying that these cohomology classes stay, stay integral. So they have the boundedness. That's, as I said, is true away from the prime P. If we have P in the level of these characters, which we absolutely want to do, then um, in order to get things like the chaotic L function, then we have to do, do more work. What I said is true provided the Fourier expansion at every cusp is integral. This is um, by an argument due to fault things. And, um, and really, it's in, we would look at the image of, of this cohomology inside the cohomology of V. So it would be integral. We know that's in here modulo some, some torsion. Um, And, uh, and then, but that's only, so we can only know that about the Fourier expansion for some particularly nice Eisenstein series, but they're not the ones that we want for the Euler system. But we get the ones that we want from the Euler system by now translating those by, by, by some elements in, in GF. And, and, and it's some, some linear transformation or some linear over, over integral over Q over P. Uh, translations. And so, um, so what I said is, is correct. These, these always end up staying, giving us our, our, our bounded, bounded classes. And then we have to detect um, the, uh, the norm relation. And now this is another subtle point. So the class, I wrote this as a C chi psi. But really, it also depends on this m, right? Because I might have characters psi that are imprimitive at m, and they come from a, from a smaller modulus. In fact, um, right. So if we take the co-restriction, if we had taken an, an, an ml here, and then we took the co-restriction, we would lose essentially all the, the the characters that were primitive at l. And then we just get some 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 essentially over the same same classes 
but just for, for chi times psi mod m. But the data defining those classes depended on that L. So the Eisenstein series would have been modified at the prime L a little bit. We have chosen a different section uh, here. And, um, and that is actually important for uh, making sure that the Fourier coefficients work out well too, it turns out. Um, and then one has to compare. The normalization then comes from comparing what did you get the, the class with, with the, the section modified in L with, with the, the class with the, with the section where, where L didn't divide M, in which case you took the, the spherical section um, for the Eisenstein series. And then that becomes an entirely local calculation. Because what one what you can really think of is going on, and then I'll have to stop. This is going to tell, tell you where the norm relations come from. Is that I'll, I'll have my, my sort of chi psi at the prime L, the local representation. And by fixing the data away from L, so I can take a section here, so L, and then I can fix the data away from L. So then this will go to, to an Eisenstein series F. And then, so then we get our Eisenstein series mega F. And then this goes, goes to some, some class. EF. The H1, and then eventually the H2 of the Schmoor variety for H. And, and this, and then we can replace this with, with our, our representation. What did I say? The ad, uh, sin square of the ad, and then tensor the pi of F. This is a representation of, of, of H. And this is H. QL equivariant. So I can think of this and then, and I can affix the data away from, um, so I can put pi of that L and then I can, I can affix kind of the projection here. L. Um, uh, and so I have, a, and then it turns out there's a multiplicity one statement. Um, for such linear functionals into here. And so I can leverage that local multiplicity one to sort of say, well, I'm going to take any such functional, like say the one that comes from, from the doubling method, zeta integral, evaluate it on the spherical vector, evaluate it on the, the, the modified vector in L, compare the two results, and they turn out to be the, the L factor that you want um, in your, your norm relation. So this kind of argument has been used in a number of Euler systems now, so this isn't this is a new situation. Um, there's something else about this this particular map that's that's um, important, but uh, that that's for the later arithmetic applications. So okay, so I grossly underestimated uh, how much material I would get to cover within. In this period, um, but here, here's a, a vague outline of, of where we're constructing an Euler system for the symmetric square. Um, Henri has has convinced me to to, to return to Berkeley and, and give a few more lectures there. So maybe that you can return the the the, the favor and, and, and if you want to see more and, and watch them on Zoom here. All right, I, I have to stop like that. Are there any questions for Chris? Any questions from Zoom? Oh, yeah, go ahead. So, you know, you are restricted to weight two, and if you have higher weight, you have you have a sheaf, and then you will take the tensor product of that sheaf and its dual, and maybe map down to H two Y proportions. One could try, yes, to do all the, the same the same things in, in those pictures. Um, 
I'm we just stuck to wait weights two for for um, for simplicity and maybe because I, I don't want to deal with local systems and all my comparison things for, for cohomology, but I, I believe a lot of that now exists, but I yeah. So um, inequality may be an issue. So the question, I know people, the question was, was what about higher weight basically? So, yeah. I have a question, if you can hear me. Yes, yes, David. Um, so you were saying that in order to, to, to check the integrality of these linear combinations of classes, it suffice yes. to check some integrality of Fourier coefficients of an Eisenstein series. Can you That's explain correct. how that worked? Yes. Um, so let's first assume that things let, let's, um, are, are good away from P. Let's start there. That's OK. So, so everything is sort of smooth at P. Are you comfortable with that? So, so then we would have what I want to say is we have an integral version in that case of, of Pieta Kodge theory. Um, I'll, I'll ignore issues of small primes for the moment. Um, so then we would have sort of the Schmur variety uh, for, for G. Okay, so that's what we're calling H or X. X over Q bar, maybe with, with Q T coefficients. Um, if I tend to do this with with B to run, then you have to take um, let's take G Q P pi. Remember everything is 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 unramified at, at the moment in this picture. Then I have my class here. So I have a very particular class inside here. I have my 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 little class because it's the Galois group is only acting by by epsilon to the to the minus third power. And so then I have this. So I actually have this belonging to that. And at the same time, I would have um, an isomorphism in this integral version with the Durand cohomology. Um, X over, uh, well, actually, x over the ring of integers in this case. Um, if, if by the fact, so now, so now, well, okay, so now I'm being really, really bad. So, so now, if I, I would have an, I would have, I would have this, what I had before. Now everything is is good. So I can replace this by a Chris, and I can replace this by by, by the, the ring of integers of, of QP, whatever. So I have this, and here, we we, we want to know about this. But here's my differential. Mega v chi, because it had integral Fourier coefficients, it belongs to here. It matches up with this class. How do I know that? Again, I can I can just look exactly at the constant terms. So I do the same calculation with constant terms. So I see that these two classes match up. So this is telling me that this is inside here. But T bar is not divisible by by by, by P, say, inside A Chris. And so this class had to have been integral. So that's the unramified argument to produce integral classes. What about the primes at, uh, when you have p in the level? So faultings actually gives an argument um, in the very last section of this paper on the arithmetic of Eisenstein series. This is the paper in the number fields and function fields, two parallel worlds. Yes. And um, so he explains um, how to deal with the situation where you would have uh, the prime p in the level here, um, as long as you know that the, your Eisen's or your, your cohomology class had, um, well, in this case, had, had, had this, this class had um, all of its Fourier coefficients integral at p, then he's, he's able to show that the, he's no longer doing this kind of integral Pietic Hodge theory, but in a, a similar picture, he's, he's getting a map from, from in this case, would be from H3 um, to, 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 a, to a tall cohomology. I mean, there's a, there's a tensor OCP, 
instance or OCP, and there's probably a, a minus three, three twist or a three twist to take care of the minus three inside there. So it's you know, uh, and he, it's where you know he deduces the integrality from some. This is an almost isomorphism. What if I take? Well, I have to do various things, and um, and so one needs to, to have a class. Yeah, and, and so at least when, when the class inside here had all of its, its Fourier coefficients integral at every cusp, then, then one, can, one can deduce that the class, class was, was in fact integral. Um, and then, I mean, for example, you can see that if it was the ordinary Eisenstein series, and by ordinary, I mean I, ordinary for the UP eigenform. Associated to this element, then that Siegel Eisenstein series has integral Fourier coefficients at all the cusps and gives me a class inside here. And the classes that we want can actually be just then um, extracted from those by taking some translation by elements. And that's that's all that's that's happening. Um, thank you. Sure. And I mean, there's an interesting feature. If you if you try to do this for for GL two, um, what you find out is that the, the ordinary Eisenstein series of way two that contributes to to something integral. But if you want to sort of key deplete this, then, then there's like there's like a character in here. You actually, not surprisingly, have to take you get this Cal sum with, with the p depletion that to be your integral. And, and you can you can even see that if you looked at the the critical stabilization of the Eisenstein series, then to have the constant term have the right rationality properties, um, what, so just to be integral in, in Okai, then in fact you actually need this this calcium. Right. and that comes out naturally from the kinds of translations that we do. The Gaussian pops out. Are there other questions? That was a long answer. But. Uh, well, if there are no other questions, let's thank Chris again.